Chapter 5. Mita and Flo, the Forest Children Flo, I'll race you to that tree over there, said Mita, pointing to one of the maple trees. Okay, I said confidently. I was one of the fastest runners among the girls of my age in our village. I wondered why Mita was even challenging me to a race. Immediately, Mita flew like an arrow straight toward her target. She was clearly hoping that a quick start would give her an advantage over me. However, like a shooting star that bursts across the night sky, I was on her heels in no time. Just before we reached the tree, I passed her and touched the tree trunk. I won, I exclaimed. You're pretty fast, though, Mita, I admitted. Considering you are a year younger than me, that was quite a race. Yes! This time next year, when we return to the maple tree forest, I'll be able to beat you, Mita said confidently, while at the same time grinning at me. I grinned back. I'll still be a year older than you, I said, rising to the challenge. I know, you'll always be that. But I have a feeling that this time next year, I will be taller than you. She replied as if she were stating a fact. Well, we'll see about that, I replied as I eyed her feet. They were already bigger than mine, and she was only a thumb size shorter than me. I couldn't help thinking that she might be right, but I wasn't going to admit it. This was my favorite time of year by far. It was the time of year when the eagles built their spring nests. The chickadees made their strange, eerie call in the early morning. The snow was melting all around, and tree buds were emerging daily. This was also the time of year when my family, along with my uncles and aunts and their children, set up camp in the maple tree forest. We did this every year at the beginning of spring. We left our summer and winter village and returned to our camp in the forest. In the fall, we camped near the fields we planted our crops in. We always returned to the same maple forest camp. It was a good-sized clearing encircled by a large number of maple trees and birch trees. We returned here each year to collect the sap from the maple trees and turn it into the sweet syrup that we all loved so much. This year, we were lucky. The winter winds and frequent snowfall had not destroyed our wigwam frames from the previous year. We only had to wrap the deerskin that we had carried with us around the frames. After we made our campfire, the children had a chance to play before the real work began. Once we were settled, the men would use their axes to make small, deep cuts in the trunks of the maple trees. Then, we would wait for the sap to trickle out. As it did, the women and children would funnel the sap into birch baskets or clay pots. We used curved pieces of cedar wood or hollowed out sumac stems as funnels. Sap from the maple tree looks like water when it first trickles out from inside the tree. Once the sap is collected, my mother and aunts cook it in a clay pot. Sometimes they put the pot right on the open campfire. Other times they put red hot rocks right into the clay pots. After you've cooked it for a while, the sap turns into sweet syrup. If you keep on cooking it, the sap turns into sugar. During this time, the older girls also collect birch bark. They strip the bark from the trees and pound it until it can be shaped and molded into storage containers or dishes. The men and boys busy themselves hunting and fishing. In the evening, we all spend time together around the campfire exchanging stories. Come on, Flo, yelled Mita, who had wandered off to watch the men at work. I can smell dinner cooking. She was right. The succulent smell of deer meat wafted up into the crisp evening air. Race you back, I announced. This time, I took off like an arrow shot from my father's bow. <laughs>